Hi, we're down at Honor Sound Studios in Bristol with John Parrish for record production. Uh, thanks for having us. Pleasure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so when did you actually set this latest version up? When we first moved into this into this house, um, I had some. I had a friend with his son that was living in the yeah, basement remember, here. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so my, all of my studio gear was crammed into one tiny room on the on the ground floor oh, yeah. upstairs, which sort of opened out into the lounge and I would kind of gradually spill out into the lounge when I was working. But it meant that I had to sort of, you know, pack everything down every evening when the kids oh, got okay. back from school and yeah. it was all a bit of a, you know, it was, it was fine and I recorded some pretty good stuff there, but it wasn't, it wasn't the most convenient way of working. Yeah. And so when, when we kind of reclaimed this space, which was about seven or eight years ago now, I think, you know, I, it's for, for, uh, this really for me is like a workspace for me. That was primarily the, the, the function of the studio. And so it was for a writing space and, and for recording a lot of my film music. Yeah. Uh, you know, as time has gone on and, as, and once I put this desk in, I started, I've started to do more and more mixing here. But again, mixing is not... You know, it, it doesn't. It doesn't matter if some. You know, if, if somebody's walking across yeah. the scene, it's not like um, it's going to be affecting mm. what, what I'm doing. It, the only time it, it, it affects me is if I'm recording some very quiet stuff, which I sometimes do for some of the film soundtrack work, and then I just, you know, have to work around other people. Yeah, I guess you, know, you can and, hear hear the road a little bit. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you you can, and sometimes you know, <laughs> there's there's definitely ambulance sirens mm. on quite a few of my recordings for sure. Yeah, that could be quite nice. But yeah, sometimes. sometimes it sometimes it totally works, and if it yeah. doesn't, then I have to record it again. That's yeah, what. I guess the is the loudest thing you do like a bit, little bit of drums. And... Yeah, drums are, are probably the loudest. I mean, sometimes some of the amps get a bit noisy, but drums are probably the thing that. Yeah. That if anything's going to go next door, it will be the drums that, mm. that, that people hear. That's yeah, you can't really turn a AC. 15 or 30 down, can you? They're loud. They, they, yeah, well, 15's much easier for recording. I mean, I tend to use a 15 all the time for recording. I really yeah. like 30s for live because you've got a little bit more weight. Yeah, but yeah, yeah but you, you need to crank them a little bit in order to get them to work. Whereas that one sounds pretty good. It, it does, you, don't, you don't have to crank that one to get it to work. Okay. Has that just got like a 10 inch? It's got 112 inch. The 112 inch, okay. Just like a little AC30. Yeah, yeah, like half an AC30, exactly, yeah, yeah. as you as you would expect. Mm. Okay, so we're we working on anything interesting, sort of recently. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, um, yeah, t a, t a ton of stuff. Um, just kind of piecing together, sort of finishing off a couple of records at the moment. Just done a new um, a new dry cleaning album, yeah. which we recorded in in Rockfield, tracked in Rockfield, cool. and mixed predominantly at Playpen Studios. Yeah. Um, but I did, you know, I did do some tweaking, tweaking here, particularly with one of the songs where we had to cut a vocal after we'd, yeah. you know, our, our, you know, we we, Flo, the singer, decided she wanted to change the vocals on one of the tracks. So that was done a couple of months after we'd finished everything else. So we we finished that one in here, which was which was really handy. Did she come here to do the? No, we tracked it at Four AD's. Okay, yeah. They've got a studio, you know, just up at the record company in the basement. Yeah. Oh, cool. Uh, but I did all the mi I mixed that one here, yeah. and um, I've been working on a. Well, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this actually, but probably am. Yeah. Been working on a new PJ Harvey album, but that won't be out for quite a while. Yeah. Yeah, I think I saw something come up. Oh, uh, yes, I think that's what. That, I think that's why I thought. Oh, yeah, I probably can say yeah, something because I, I have seen there. that it's been already leaked that it's happening because Polly's got a new book. That's come out. I think Maybe it's, it's the I think book. It's I think it might be in the book that I saw. Not the, the book is out this week. Yeah. But I think in the first big interview about the book, she mentioned that there was a record. Okay. And are they sort coming. of tied in? They're connected. Yeah, yeah for sure. The, um, <clears throat> the um, because the um, yeah some of the words because it's a book of it's like a long form poetry book. Yeah. Um, it's amazing. It, it's an amazing book. Um, and um, some of the poems are the lyrics. Okay. For the new album, I thought you know probably been um, you know tweaked in order to so, so, so they yeah, so yeah. they so they melodically fit with, but um but it, yeah it's absolutely connected. Is it sort of in a do ancient Dorset. It's in Dorset. Di it's in Dorset dialect, which yeah. um, it's funny because I just read I've just finished reading the book actually, and and the the dialect is in many ways is much more obvious when you're reading it than it is when you're listening to the songs. When you're listening okay. to the songs. I think it's um, because of the melodicism 
of it and the atmosphere, you kind of go with words that you don't understand. Because sometimes when you listen to music, you often miss words anyway, don't you? Or you yeah, often oh, miss hear yeah, words. Yeah, I, I do. Yeah. Um, and so, it, in a way, it works. Although, it's, although the lyrics are in Old Dorset dialect, that's not the kind of... That's not really the first thing that you notice when you're hearing the record. Okay. I, I, th I think that that's in in a way you would you're more like if you were, if you were reading the lyric sheet at the same time you would think oh that's a strange word I wonder what that means but if you're listening to it, I, I think the meaning becomes very apparent because in the way, mm. in the way that a good actor sort of can use Shakespearean dialogue and it's very very easy to comprehend mm. where it might not be if you were reading it. I think it's the same way the way okay. way Polly phrases something the meaning becomes the meaning is sort of implicit in the phrasing it becomes much more e even if sometimes you might be you might make your own meaning to it and it might mean something different to what yeah. she's saying i think it kind of makes it has it it has a very natural sense okay yeah but there, are there some because sort of growing up in that area there's some words that you found that sort of hung on yeah you, for, for, for sure i mean i grew up in somerset yeah <laughs> on the board on the Dor somerset dorset border but for sure there are you know, there are words uh, to me that that are quite familiar from when from when I was growing up. Yeah. Not, not everything I have to say, yeah. but a, lo a lot of things, and particularly okay. the the all the Zs and things, and the, the that that kind of the Dorset burr that's there. That that that's very familiar to me. Okay. Yeah. Uh... Yeah. I mean, it was still you know it was still very very rural and. Um, and agricultural when I was growing up, even though I grew up in Yeovil, you know, Molly yeah. grew up in a little village, so she was much more exposed to the, that's, sl you know, I mean, you know, you know how it is, you kind of got villages, towns and cities and, and sort of different levels of modernity, so she was mm. definitely at the, you know, at one yeah. one step down from where, from, from where I was, but even I was very aware of that, you know, just that, to me, reading it was it was brought back a lot of memories of um, okay. of, of how it was growing up in a, in a sort of a rural place and yeah. at that time. Yeah. Do you know when that's out then? Yeah. Or was that even been announced? I don't know yet. Yeah. Ne next year, but I don't I don't know when. Be, be a while. Yeah. Mm. That'd be interesting. I mean, it? we haven't even it's not even mastered yet. Oh, so is it? Oh, right. Oh, so it's yeah. really yeah. 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 Cool. So the new Eels album that uh, came out this year. Um, tell me a bit about that. Um, the New Eels album, yeah. uh, Ext Extreme Witchcraft, <laughs> it came <laughs> out. Um, it came out in February, I think. Okay. Yeah. So, so a couple of months ago. Yeah. yeah. Um, Twenty years after the first. Yeah, one. I, was, I was looking, <laughs> looking yeah. today. Yeah, it's almost exactly. Yeah, yeah which funny. seems, like, yeah, uh, unfathomable to me. But there you go. Um, uh, and much like Soul Jacker, it was done pretty quickly. Like, like it's, yeah, I, it's I, I really like working with E because he's very definite about what he likes and what he doesn't mm. like so there's the, and he's very very quick to respond to things so um you know i think he just he wrote to me at the beginning of last year when um we were in one of the many lockdowns yeah. <laughs> and um and just said oh, i'm doing a new record i want it to be a bit rockier than the last couple that i've done um have you got any music? Have you got anything that I might be able to use? Oh, okay. And so I thought, oh yeah, you know, I, I've got a couple of things kicking around, you know, because I've always got bits and pieces that I'm sort of working yeah. on that are in various states of completion. And there was one that was kind of done, you know, and I thought, oh, this, this is a good track. Okay, I'll send it to E and just see if this is the kind of thing mm. he's looking for. And so I sent him this one piece. Like literally about two hours later, he sent it back to me with vocals oh, right. on it. Oh wow! <laughs> um, and said, "Okay, th so th these are the vocals, but it needs to be, you know, the, can the, this is the chorus. Can you make it happen one more time here?" And so yeah. he wanted me to sort of rearrange it, okay. um, so it fitted with fitted with the lyrics. So I spent the next day sort of recutting it, and then sent it to him, and then he recorded the vocals on it, and it was done. Oh, nice. And that's like. That's really is the way he worked. And then he was called like, "Great, have you got any more?" Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, ping in just Pro Tools. Yeah, just yeah, board. yeah. I mean, the, the, that one was just a mix. I literally sent him oh stereo a stereo mix. Oh okay. That, that, that I then edited the stereo mix because because yeah. um, I didn't have the Pro Tools files. For, okay. I didn't know, you know, like because I'm, I'm for my own housekeeping, I'm really really mm. terrible. Has to be said. I'm I'm good when I'm producing other people. Yeah. <laughs> but for my own work, I'm you know that's. 
because I'm working by myself, I don't think to, oh, like, I need to put that in that file, I need to label that, you know, it's yeah. called, it's called Tuesday, you know, 10 o'clock or whatever like that, when it, and, and then then I wonder why I can't find it yeah. sort of Especially later Especially when on. you're in sort of a creative mode. Yeah, it's not you, like... exactly. I don't want to sit there and think, oh, if I put it in the, have I saved it to the right place? So I do, mm. I'm, I do lose stuff at home. So I'd lost the files for that. And the mix was, I, I eventually relocated them, but um, by that time, you know, there's something about the mix. You know, sometimes you do a mix and it's just right. And yeah. you think, oh, I can, I can recreate that. And I tried really hard to recreate it. Yeah, and it's it. never there. Just didn't sound as good. So we went with oh, the original mix and I just edited the two tracks so it fitted the format that, um, that, that, that you needed for the vocals. So you on every track on the album? Or? No, no, I'm on, I think I'm on seven. Seven. Seven out of the 12. Um, there was a couple he'd already done, a couple had already been done, mm. maybe three, and um, and I think I had probably of the ones I sent him, there were probably two or three others that I'd sort of vaguely started that I sent him, and then everything else I wrote in, you know, within a period of about a month or six weeks. Okay, so I wrote and recorded. So you're, you're drumming on. Yeah, I'm playing. Oh, playing I'm playing. Everything yeah. on the on the on the on the tracks that I'm on, I'm playing. Oh, okay, the, with just his vocal. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, they mixed it. You know, it was mixed with um, a guy called Cool G Murder, who also worked on Soul Jacker. So you know, oh, okay. and yeah, toured with Soul say... Jacker when I was touring with them. Yeah, I listened so, to them back to back actually. And it, yeah, had a similar kind of. I think there's a similar energy. Yeah. Isn't it? That, which they is. sound like twenty years. Like yeah. Apart. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, he's got such a you know. Uh, such a trademark sound, you know, that he, yeah. he he's very, very recognisable what he does. And um, yes, yeah, I mean, for me, it was very refreshing to make something, it was like a burst of energy. Mm. Um, because, uh, you know, a lot of projects, especially sort of remote projects, they can sort of drag on for ages and ages. And it, what was really great was probably within the time from him sending me that first email saying, have you got anything to the album being finished was probably two months. So the okay. entire thing was written, recorded, and mixed in two months. In two months. Oh, cool. So were you were you doing some of that at the playpen, the drums, or was it? All no, just I did. Done, ever, done I did everything in here. Mm. Okay, cool. Yeah, there's some cool sounding drums. Mm. So did you did you meet up at all? <laughs> no, <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, at that time, it was um, it wasn't possible to travel mm. to yeah, the yeah. US. So for me, and were you like zooming or just? No, we didn't even zoom. It was really just. Just by email, it was really, it was a very, very, like I say, he's, he's so direct to work with. So he didn't want work with every song I sent him. There's a couple he's like, oh, I can't work with that, you know, that's too weird, yeah. or no, I can't think of anything to do with that. But but if he liked it, then then very, very quickly, something would come come back, you know, yeah. almost always within a day of me sending him a track, oh, cool. there would there would be words for it. Cool. So how, how was Soul Jacker different then? Were you, did you actually go into a studio I, together for that? Yeah, that was... I mean, obviously, that was. I was going to say it was pre Pro Tools, but it wasn't. Soul Jack was the first thing I did on Pro Tools. Okay. That was the first time I'd ever even seen it, in fact, really? I think. Yeah. Um, and we didn't do everything on Pro Tools because the first track, Dog Face Boy, which was the first song we wrote together, mm. that was done pre Pro Tools because we'd, we'd met up. You know, we, we actually met on a, a, an edition of Top of the Pops when oh, Eels right. and PJ Harvey were on. And, yeah. um, and um, me and he, me and E were on the same publishing company. So we kind of were vaguely, we were aware of each other anyway. Yeah. And we'd said, oh yeah, we should do something together. And, and, and my publishers were really keen for me to write more songs because I wasn't writing very much at that mm, time. And, okay, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so they sent me over to LA to do a couple of things. And I did, wrote a song with E, which was Dogface Boy, okay. which we recorded in their studio on, onto tape, you know, in yeah. old school. And um, and that became the first song of the album. Yeah. And then I went home and wrote, and again, wrote and recorded some stuff in, in my own studio and um, sent it to E, which he really liked, wrote some words. And then we arranged to do a session in LA where I'd go back to LA and I was there for, I think, three weeks. Okay. And um, we recorded all the lyrics for all the stuff that I'd already done at home, and then probably wrote another four or five songs while we were there. You know, so, right. so it's not it's all quite of which. A long album, isn't yeah, it? and there's yeah. also been stuff that's come out. So, you know, not everything we wrote together 
came out on the record. So there's been okay. two or three like or B sides on various edition. or yeah, yeah. yeah, you know how it is, yeah. Extra orange vinyl mm. with a yeah. 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 With a whatever. There's loads of, if you go on Spotify it's loads, loads the whole extra bit. Yeah, of, yeah. On the back end. And then did you tour? So I, remember, I toured with Soul Jacker. Yeah, because I remember turning on the TV once and just watching like Reading Festival and then you were like on stage. Ah, oh, right, yeah, we, then, played, then we played He was Reading. there with this like tiny <laughs> little cabin. <laughs> and then like the drummer had like a huge, I think he had a huge bass drum. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so you did quite like a, yeah, a, a did, big tour. Yeah, it, it was a big tour. I mean, I actually only did half of it because um, cause Hopi, my second daughter, was born okay. halfway through. Yeah. So, um, I jumped chip when you know when when she was born and a friend of mine took over. Yeah. But I really enjoyed the six months I did. It was yeah. it was really good fun. Are they fun guys? Yeah, yeah, yeah. great. It was it was a really good tour. Mm. Yeah, he's done loads of albums. I was looking. Yeah, yeah I mean not, that, really that, that's that's one of the tours. Of course, the Extreme Witchcraft tour is one of the ones that's been okay. affected by COVID because they they would have supposed to tour when the record came out. Yeah. But it was still. I mean, you know, it would probably have been all right, but at the time, you know, you know, they, they, yeah, they you know, with a tour of that size, you can't make mm. a decision the month before you go out. You know, you have to make the decision three, four, five months beforehand. And I think it was just like, oh, this is too, it's still too, there's too many unknowns. We don't yeah. know if the shows are going to yeah, happen. We much. can't risk it. Yeah. Which is really a drag. So it's been postponed till next year. So are you doing any of that or? No, 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 no I'm not. No. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I want to go to a show, and I might, yeah. I might guest on a number. I'm, I'm sure, but, uh, but I, I'm, I'm not, not a part of the band. Yeah. Okay. Are they doing sort of O2 o- size venues? Or yes, I think. Yeah, they, yeah. in Bristol, that's what yeah. they would do. Yeah. That, that, I think the last time I saw them in Bristol was at the O2. Mm. Oh, cool. Yeah, really, really good band. Yeah. Yeah. No, I forgot. Band. I forgot kind of how good they they yeah. were. Yeah. Listening, listening to it again. Okay. Yeah. It is. They're a cool band. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yes. Yeah, so you're saying you just done a, another dry cleaning record. That's so right. They both from Rockfield. They were. Yeah. yeah. So same. Same kind of deal, really. Um, we did the first one at Rockfield in the. It was. It was actually the first thing that I did coming out of the first lockdown. Okay. So we did it in the summer of 2019. And uh, yeah, it was it was really really great experience. Hadn't worked with them before. Obviously, it was their first album. They'd done a couple of EPs, so they, mm. there was quite a buzz about them. And um, and I'd met them through the, the label because obviously I'd worked with with Aldous Harding, who's yeah, on Four AD as well. Yeah. So <clears throat> so I, I knew the the people at the label knew me, and they thought I'd be a good fit with dry cleaning. And yeah, we got along really well. And I thought they were really creative, and great players, and yeah. really interesting songs and flows. Lyrics are just great, mm. and her delivery is great. Yeah, it's um, quite, it, quite unique. It was obviously, you know, it's, it's kind of a tricky thing to get, you know, it's, it's how you balance something like that, something mm. that, that because because it's um, the whole essence of her delivery is that very, very casual offhandedness, it's conversational, mm. with, you know, quite a ferocious yeah. rock band yeah. happening <laughs> at the same time. So it's, it's how you manage, it's how you keep mm. the power of the band, but you make, but you have to catch the words, you have to catch them all. Yeah. Because you, you because they're so, it, they're so good, you don't want to miss the things and it's frustrating if there's, mm. like, like I think sometimes you can, you can, there are some, like I'm listening to, you know, like I say, like the way they mix the vocals in like a lot of the Rolling Stones tracks or some, 70s Bowie tracks. The vocals are really damn, mm. but it doesn't matter if you miss some of the, some of the things because you've got the essence of what's going on, and I think that that can work really well. Something like dry cleaning, that's not going to work. It, it's just going to be like you, you listen yeah. to somebody talk at like it'd like, be like listening to somebody in a pub and the music's too loud, you can't hear what they're saying. Yeah. You constantly go yeah. what what, and so I was trying to find a way of setting the vocal in the track. Yeah. That was really prominent and clear, but didn't didn't make the music sort of move into move into the background. So it was. Um, so are they, are they tracking? You, are you tracking them the, like the band live? Yeah, and it's often mostly? flow in the in the same room actually. In the same. Okay. Yeah. Um, and screen, that, those vocals off. are making the. Uh, yes, yeah. not on every track, but on on probably half of them, and, and the, the same with the new album that we've yeah. also just that we've just done that's just been being mastered at the moment. Um, 
So it's quite it's, quite a lot of bleed in the. There, there there is bleed, but we do it, you know, with a, obviously very. I mean, it, it's. It, it takes really careful mixing because I can't leave a mic open, you know, in between lines. Yeah. So it's about being. So when she's doing her vocals, it sort of overpowers the bleed it, 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 Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, and so if you, you have to be very careful to go sort of... You're just sort of trimming it all. Yeah, yeah. Re really careful trimming. And um, and and, and it, it actually works It works quite well because... It's, yeah, I wondered how you... Yeah, because yeah, there's something about like a live delivery... I mean, this is, the, this is you know, the age of conundrum, isn't it, in recording? Like, like the, the more stuff you cut live, the generally the better the performance uh, and the harder it is it's to, <laughs> to get a good yeah. sound and yeah. a good mix so so you, you but, uh, f but for me the 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 perform a great performance trumps um sonic yeah. issues you yeah. know provide you know with within reason sometimes it's just like okay uh, I, I did get asked to mix a live dry cleaning track mm. at one point for a video and um and that was impossible because yeah because there was just there was so much band on the vocal mic, you you couldn't e even when Flo was singing, you couldn't. The band was way way louder than the vocal, so I just couldn't do it with that. And I had to, I had to cheat by using another vocal, uh, and mixing sort of it just balance. You know, mix, uh, and the thing is that Flo's, while it sounds like it's really casually, just almost tossed off. The vocal is it's it's incredibly precise where yeah. she puts things. So, from well, another, from a studio like. recording, I could take a studio recording of the vocal, and it was almost identical to okay. that live Are one. They play into like a click live, or no? Or they're just steady. No, they're pretty, yeah. They're, they're next really steady. The drummer and Lewis, the bass player. They're, they're a great rhythm section. Mm. They're really really together. So it's most of what you're hearing on the record that live performance with a few. Yeah, I mean minutes. Tom, the guitar player, will overdub quite a few things sometimes yeah. so, so some of the guitars are sort of layered up and there's some like electronic yeah bits, bits and of, yeah, yeah bits and pieces of strange electronic sounds that sometimes that's joe jones the engineer rock who rock okay. who comes up with some of those sort of crazy sounds All right. and yeah. some of it's the pedals that um that tom's using. yeah you can do some mad stuff yeah I mean. yeah i mean he's a great guitar i mean they're 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 a really good band you know really good band and so the new record's kind of similar Sort of, I'd uh, say it's approach. a pro progression, but it's a yeah. you know we we a similar way of recording in that it was, yeah. it was cut pretty much live with with um with additions. There's probably a little bit more arranged in some places, and there's some brass on a couple of tracks and horns. Um, and I would say, uh, yeah, I think I th I think they've kind of they're probably you know they're really really establishing a sound now and i think mm. the new album is I, I i would say for me it's definitely progression from okay. the first I, I think in um in sort of um in the quality of the yeah just the quality of the songwriting uh, yeah. i think i think it's really mm. really great i mean i think the first album is great but i could for me that i feel they've stepped up a stepped up a level on this one Oh, cool. Yeah, I think I think you played me a song. But we, it's, yeah, it's cool. played, but it was like yeah. really rough, mm. like mix. Yeah. Like yeah. Mm. Oh, cool. So um, yeah, you've been using Rockfield quite a, a bit for a few years now. Yeah, Rockfield is, is my of... it's my preferred tracking studio. Really, just yeah. I, I really like it there because particularly the Quadrangle is the one that I was. Yeah. Used. Have you ever been done anything in the coach house? I did one day in there just because the desk broke down oh, right. in the quadrangle and there was yeah. nobody in the coach house so we moved over to the quadrangle for a day okay. to cut something um, mm -hmm. to cut the title track on Warm Chris actually the new Aldous Harding album that, so oh, that right. was cut in the coach house okay. everything, everything, everything else, else was done at the quadrangle yeah, I've been in the, the quadrangle for a look round but I've mm. not recorded in there it, it seems it's great quite like a lot of space. there's a lot of space which works for me so there's a lot of different acoustic spaces so you can have a lot of people playing simultaneously and still have quite yeah. a lot of separation even in the same room you can be there's, is it's, it quite dead, dead the main it, it's dead yeah. really dead in i mean it's like the 70s you know the whole place yeah, is like being in in the 1970s yeah. really um so it kind of yeah it really suits me not the 1970s with a computer that's the, you know that's, yeah. the, that's the only uh the only concession they've made to you know the 21st century i think yeah, and so it's, so it's got like a drum kind of room at the back, mm. and you've got the big, and there's it got some booths. Too. Yeah, two big booths for um, you know amps and things. 
like a big main room with a nice grand piano in it and then you've got the control room and then there's another room another big yeah, room behind like the control pool, room pool table in it or something. Yeah, yeah it's kind of so you can either play pool in there or you can it's a really good live room so it's great okay. for horns and oh, it's okay. great for um it's nice for drums actually if you want like if you wanted to play like sort of quiet drums but with a big open sound you know mm. almost more of a sort of a jazz kind of sound you know where you've got a big open no yeah. dampening but you know, not not being thwacked. But you know, yeah. it, it's that's got a really fantastic sound in that room. Okay. There. And how how does that room at the back, like the kind of big drum booth room, sound? Uh, I I really like it. I think it can be. Uh, it totally works for me. I think because of the nature of the bands that I record, I don't tend to record a lot of um, like old school rock drummers like that really bash symbols. the kit. Yeah. I think if I think if it's if you're one of those. Yeah, like really hard hitters with really bright cymbals. I think it's quite extreme. Okay, uh, I've heard that people struggle with it for that, but for the kind of people I work with, like, yeah. it works really, really well. Yeah, and I think is that they've got like kind of wooden things that you can move to change. Yeah, like them. big. Yeah, you can you can cl yeah. you can close it down for sure. Okay. You, you know, you can make it, you, but it's but it's always going to have that glass thing because because you want that to be able to see. Through. Yeah, you, you can curtain it down so you don't have the whole. Yeah. Thing. It, it's, I mean, it's pretty flexible. You can, you can kind of do what you want. They've also got a really great reverb chamber. So, yeah, know, I think so we, yeah, yeah cause I think they're even wired down to the. Because I was in the coach house for a week. Yeah, I think I think they've we, got two chambers. They've got oh, okay. one that's wired to the coach house and one that's wired to the quad. Yeah, we went in there because it's, it's, it's not that big, but you clap and it. it it's got it's such got a good sound. Yeah, like resin on the mm. the walls. It, it, it goes it, on. It, for, it's nuts. It totally works. It's the, it's such a natural reverb. But, you know, I um, I find it quite difficult using other reverbs, really, of having done a lot with oh, that. Okay. So you just sort of print that alongside? Like, yeah, I, I always print the reverb from there. Mm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really surprising how much difference like that mm. surface makes. Yeah, like, yeah. Something like a, the one for the coach house, it was like a 10 second. Yeah, like I don't know, I don't know what, like the, what, yeah, what the decay time is. I haven't... Um, I'm not very good with numbers. Mm. Yeah, so remember you saying that you uh, applied to an ad in the back of NME to join a band like really early on. That was when you finished school or something. Yeah, that was kind of how I how I started off. You know, I mean, obviously I've been in bands when I was at school, and yeah. um, and um, when we left school, moved to Bristol with the people I was playing in a band with. And, oh, okay. And uh, <clears throat> you know, gigged around for a year or year and a half, and. Um, trying to make something happen and then you know the sort of band fell apart a couple of people went to university mm. and and I didn't really know what to do so I just yeah I just you know replied to a couple of adverts in the back of either enemy or melody yeah. maker and and um, and yeah and just auditioned for two or three different bands and I got offered a couple of couple of jobs and I decided to go with a band called thieves like us okay um, so I guess I was Probably nineteen or twenty. At and that, that, time, was, that was drumming. That was drumming. Yeah. I was drumming, um, and um, and they were kind of doing. They just put out an independent seven-inch single. I'd heard them on John Peel. Thought, wow, that sounds like they're going places. It seemed mm. really good. They were really nice guys. I got on well with them, and uh, and so yes, yeah, so joined that band. And then in the first tour I did with them, we got signed to a label by this American guy that was just sort of who owned. Bell Records and Private Stock Records and a couple of the quite successful labels and he was starting a new label. Okay. And we were the first signing and um, and he put us into a studio to record. I'd never been in a studio, so yeah. you know, at that time didn't know anything about recording. Um, and it was a place called Marcus Music and it, oh. it was, you know... Was that in London? That was in London. Yeah. It was, um, and, you know, this is the crazy thing, was I remember I remember how much it cost, and this was in 1980, it was 500 pounds a day. Mm. Um, <laughs> and, and it was funny now, because I think, you know, a, stu a good studio now is about 500 pounds yeah. a day, but at that time, you know, if you could, if you wanted to buy a house in London, you know, you could, you could buy a pretty decent flat in a really nice part of London for about 20 grand at that time. Yeah. Um, so it's just the way things, you know, the way the economics of recording is yeah, you know, compared to whether it just seems absurd. But obviously, you know, at that time it was totally unfeasible for a band to be able to go and make, go into a studio by themselves. You know, yeah, you had to you have, have a deal. Yeah, and the gear was 
like really expensive bands. Yeah, you know, it was, I, I remember, you know, it's funny how, like, so obviously I must have been interested in the things because I remember the desk was a Harrison console. Okay. You know, I'd, you know, never seen a mixing unit. To me, it was like, wow, what the hell yeah, is that? Yeah. Two inch tape machine, I didn't know what that was. You know, I'd only ever seen cassette tape. And mm. I'd see, actually, you know, I, I like, my mum had a quarter inch like Philips yeah, I mono think did. Yeah. tape machine. So, you know, I'd seen open reel tape, but I'd never seen two inch tape. So it was, yeah. you know, I found the whole thing fascinating. And I think that's probably where I started to become interested in the idea of production. I did, but I wasn't even really aware that that's what it was called. You know, it was just, I, I was kind of, I, I noticed that when we were recording, because we recorded an album with that band and, um, and that everybody else would, you know, we would do their bits and then go down the pub, and I would hang around the studio okay. with the producer and sort of say, "What, what, what's, what's that? Why are you doing that? You know, like, yeah. <laughs> would it be good to have a bit of tambourine on there and, and sort of making suggestions?" Yeah. And and um, and we worked with two different producers on that record: a guy called Mark Wallace and a guy called Steve James. Okay. Um, and both of them were really, really helpful to me and, and neither of them I think they both kind of quite quickly thought oh this guy's he's got mm. some interesting ideas and he you know doesn't know anything but he's good but his yeah. instincts are, are, are quite good so and they both taught me quite a lot about okay. you know not the technical stuff because because at that time I had no I, I, I still struggle to be interested in the technical stuff I have to say it's not it's not where my interest mm. lies it's definitely I'm interested in the artistic side of it and um but you know, I, you need to know. I needed. To, I figured out that I need to know some technical stuff in yeah, order to be to able to realise these yeah. um, uh, these ideas. And they were really helpful for that, and they were re really supportive mm. of me. And um, and uh, yeah, I'm very, I'm you know, very grateful, very grateful to that. I mean, another producer who was incredibly helpful to me early on was uh, a guy called Richard Mazda, okay. who produced. Um, uh, the fall and uh, some right. birthday party stuff yeah. but the thing that I really loved and why how we ended up meeting was a band called Wall of Voodoo from uh, Los Angeles that he produced an album called Call of the West that, okay. that me and Rob were sort of obsessed with in the early 80s and um, is that Rob Ellis? yeah yeah, yeah. and uh, <clears throat> and he he heard a demo of ours of Automatic Lamini which was my band after Thieves Like so Thieves yeah. Like Us broke up you know, uh, you know, a classic record company thing where they put out two singles, didn't do anything. Well, they just... We sort of, sort of got dropped, but, but even before we got dropped, the band broke up. Mm. And so then I started my own band, which became Automatic Lamini. Okay. With, with Rob Ellis. So it was Rob on drums then and you were fronting? Rob was on, Rob was on drums and I was on percussion. Yeah, you sang in... Yeah, so yeah. there was no, it was only... It was drums, percussion, and bass, and a okay. lot, lot of vocals. Yeah. Uh, and Richard had heard, Richard Mazza had heard one of an, an, a really early demo of ours and really liked it and took us into a studio in London to do some demos. And again, watching the, the way he went about producing, he was so, sort of to me, radical in the way he would kind of rip everything apart, you know, okay. to, like looked at things that I hadn't even thought of, like the lyrics, you know, like, why, why is that? Why are you saying that? There, I was like, at first, I was quite hostile to it. Like, mm. oh, well, that's that's how it's they go, up, yeah. you know. <laughs> and then, it's, well, do, you know, but I don't, and, you know, that, that one doesn't make sense to me. And, and it kind, of, and because I really respected the work he'd done, yeah, I thought, okay. Yeah. So, it, it, so you, you, I know that you like what we're doing because that's why we're here. But you're not getting this, so there must. So I'll have a look and see if there's another way of doing it. And I realised, oh yeah, I could change that, and it's better. Or yeah. he would edit stuff out suddenly, and you think, oh yeah, that was. That's much better yeah. now, you know, and um, and and also he wasn't afraid to record stuff fast and rough, and it made me think, oh yeah, that's good. Mm. It's about it's about get, yeah. capturing the essence of something. It's not about getting yeah, don't, don't, yeah. Don't spend ages trying to get a drum sound because then everybody's bored by the yeah, time you, you come to record it, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and everyone's already a bit pissed off and not in a very good mood. Mm. You know, if you just get it done really, really fast when the energy level's there, you're going to get something really good. Yeah, yeah, and who cares if the snare's a yeah, little yeah, bit... Yeah, exactly, right. like, who, yeah, who, yeah, nobody's, mm. nobody's going to be worried about that apart from, you know, the odd audio nerd, you know, yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Oh, cool, so, yeah, so, and then, was there a few phases of automatic Delamini then? Yeah, yeah, it was, um, 
Yeah, it kind of changed. It changed over over the years, you know. It, how was it sort of about eight, ten? How long did it? I, I suppose the, I suppose the band existed for about ten years. Mm. Um, it, initially, it was me, myself, Rob, and Jamie, a guy called Jamie Anderson. Okay. And then, then we had a sort of couple of other people, like a guy called Giles Smith came in and played for a while, and then Andy Henderson came and played drums for a while because Rob wasn't very well for a bit, and so Andy sort of deputised for him. Okay. And then, um, then Jeremy Hogg came in, the guitar player who I still work with, you yeah. know, on, on, on loads of projects, and uh, and um, and then. Oddly, when Rob Ellis left, Polly joined. You know, yeah. it's funny because they then ended, ended up, up as the mm. PJ Harvey, two thirds of the PJ Harvey trio. But um, they were never actually in automatic Lamini at the same time. Okay, um, <coughs> I thought it was, only, it was only narrowly missed each other. Mm. Um, but yeah, the band ended up was, was basically it was me, Polly, and Jeremy. It was okay. the, the core of me, Polly, and Jeremy. How did you initially sort of meet Polly? Then was that, that at college or? No, she she came to um, she met she met Jeremy actually first at a party, okay. and um, and and Jeremy came back and said, oh, "I met this girl at a party. She was playing guitar and singing. She sounded really good." And um, so that was the first I heard of her. Then she started coming to see Automatic Lamini shows, you know, and mm. sort of when we were playing around sort of some sense. She was still at school at the time. Okay. And. Uh, and um, yeah, she came to quite a few shows and started giving me tapes of her songs. And I thought thought they sounded really good. Thought her voice was great. Mm. You know, right from the songs were quite naive at that time. You know, she was seventeen. You know, mm. they were um, sort of folky, quite simple folk songs. But her singing was already really. Yeah. Good. There was something there. Like straight yeah. away, I thought, oh, she's got a great voice. So I, I just asked if she wanted to join the band. So when she left school, okay. she joined the band straight from school. And did you have a deal, like a deal then? <laughs> Not really. I mean, I had, you know, we had a publishing deal that was that provided a bit of money, so we could sort of do some. So there was some kind of infrastructure there to record and mm. and to tour. They would help a bit with touring, um, but it was very it was very difficult to put to put records. There was a big buzz about the band really when we started, and then I, I think, and this was probably another reason why I made myself learn about recording is that we. We, it was very difficult to record that band in in the eighties. I think we were kind of we were at the wrong time really because we mm. coincided with um, with massive gated reverbs on snare drums. Yeah, and uh, because we because we were all about loads and loads of percussion things, it was it, it kind of killed it really. But we didn't know any better. Everybody else was doing it. Yeah. So we thought, oh, we've got to have a big like the Smiths. Yeah, like, like that Chesterfield's album that's got that. Yeah, like that. It's just enormous. So there was just no room for anything else, yeah. and, and we, but, but we didn't know anything. We we just didn't understand why that was a problem. I did or didn't understand what the problem was, but we knew there was a problem yeah. because whenever we play recordings to people, people say, "I love you, your shows are amazing," but, but this isn't. doesn't sound. I never liked the recordings very much. It was like, oh, yeah, <laughs> uh, and we we could we could. We knew that they weren't right, but we didn't know what was wrong with it. Obviously, now if I was recording it, we'd do it. In, a totally yeah. different way. But. So did, did you do any of that at the Yeovil Studios then? The, like Ice House or...? The very last things we did at the Ice House, um, but by that time it was more of a guitar band. You know, yeah. I, I'd kind of had enough of... You know, it was a, I re really enjoyed playing with uh, just percussion, bass and drums. It was great, but, you know, after doing an album and a couple more EPs, I just felt that that was as far as I could go with with writing yeah. that kind of that kind of thing and so I wanted to use more you know and I was playing a lot more guitar by that time and I really mm. wanted to sort of explore that further oh cool yeah there was a head club in a head club it was like a, maybe they put gigs on but they had a MySpace and there was an automatic oh right the okay. Lamini song on there that was really rocky I don't know if it was anything that was I wonder released. if that was to do with um they had like a Tony Head experience song right the Chester okay song yeah there. yeah it would have been yeah because it was John Mates's label put out, or John, John Mates's label, another label in collaboration, put out the last Automatic okay. Mini album, which was yeah, quite rocky. Yeah, good, you know, guitars, two two guitars, bass, and drums in a way, quite yeah, classic, classic yeah. lineup. Mm. 
But, uh, yeah, it's not as... I, I think it's not a bad album. I mean, I say that I haven't played it for a little while. Yeah. So, so that, that one yeah. came out and... That one came out in 92, and okay. that was the last thing we did. So we did some shows around then. But I was also playing... By that time, I'd done quite a lot of producing, and I yeah. was really... So you, I guess you'd done the Chesterfields yeah. kind of stuff. And, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, that was the Chesterfields was the first thing that I produced, which was in 1986. Okay. And, um, and, uh, and, and sort of from then on, I started having sort of a parallel career as a producer, and um, yeah. which I... Yeah, you know, which was which was great. You know, I really really enjoyed doing it and learnt an incredible amount from it. And, and yeah. so was was that kettle the, the first thing you did? The first or? thing I did was the guitar in your bath EP. Okay, that, yeah. yeah. Um, and so we, did you like sort of had any training at that point, or were you sort of making it up? No, I was making it up as I went along. Uh, I, I had no, I had, had no audio training. So I was I was very reliant on the engineers that I was working with at that time. Yeah. Also, oh, you you were like producing it, and you had there was like a studio. Yeah. Yeah. So we we, it, yeah. we recorded at a place called Sam Studios in London, which is above Lakota's. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's been closed for years now, but it was it was a pretty cool studio actually. It was nice, and um, I mean, I'd done quite I'd done quite a bit of recording, so I knew I kind of knew how. The, yeah. Yeah, I knew sort of. Uh, you know how to make things sound good, even though I didn't know. You, you, I, I knew when you needed to add yeah. treble or, or take away bass, or, or I mean, I didn't. I, you know, there were things I didn't know about. I had no idea about compression at that stage, mm. but uh, but at least I had a I had a good musical sense of of how to do things, and I could help a band sound better just because I understood what was wrong with the way they were playing things. Yeah. So with the Chesterfields, it was. You know, at that stage, it was kind of tuning the guitars properly. That was the first thing. Yeah. And then helping Dom to play in time. Mm. And really, that was that was kind of the bulk of, of that job, was to try, you know, to make the, the thing, make the, yeah. the kind of the framework just a little bit more solid. Except the songs. And it was. And they like yeah, got, yeah, they, 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 did, they did. They just didn't know how to record them. And, and it was, um, I mean, you know, we, we were both learning a lot about the band and me at that time, for sure. Mm. Cool. So did it grow? I guess I suppose after Automatic Delamini, that was kind of the end of that, and then were you, were you just more doing production then? Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't quite as clear cut as that because you know Automatic Delamini, because I started producing things like halfway through the ten year yeah. run of Automatic Delamini. So, so I was still doing quite a lot of Automatic Delamini stuff while I was producing other things, a lot of indie, you know. At that time, you know, my first five or six years of production was all indie, UK indie bands. Mm. And it was only, you know, that didn't change until I did, the, until I did, worked on To Bring You My Love, you know, with, with BJ Harvey, the, which suddenly put me into a different, Yeah. you know, that, that was, was that it. sort of mid 90s? That was 90, we recorded that in 94. Okay. So it came out in 95 and that was, from then on, I that then, so that just opened up a kind of well, opened up the whole world really to me then yeah. because it, because it was a successful and so you, record do you all over the co-produce world. Co-produce that and played on it. Yeah, 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 and that was really, you know, I wasn't hired as a co-producer. That was very much Flood's. Call. So that, that was a Flood. Yeah, yeah. So Flood was producing it, but yeah. you know, it became, you know, after a while we we spent quite a long time in the studio and I was there every day. You know, playing a lot of the instruments, and also, I suppose Polly was bouncing a lot of ideas off me because you know we that was how we'd mm. worked in Automatic Lumini, and um, and I think about halfway through or two thirds of the way through the process, at one point, Flood just said we, we should give John a co-production credit on this, or he's producing this record with me, yeah, uh, and I th and that was very generous of him, and I've since learned it's very typical of Flood. He's really very generous of that. With that, you know, and um, and obviously that made a massive, massive difference yeah. to me because it because that record came out with my name on as a producer and it was you know internationally successful and so then I started getting asked to do bands from other countries and and um, and also you know working with Flood in the studio for three months yeah I also have, learned yeah. A, an enormous amount you know yeah what's he so he's he's, he's good to work with yeah he's fantastic yeah. you know he's great he's really amazingly creative. Mm. 
really thinks outside the box. I mean, he, he came at recording from, he came to producing from totally the opposite angle for me. He came from engineer, you know, T-boy. Oh, he did the... Tape yeah. op, engineer, producer. He sort of went, went up that line, whereas yeah. I was like in a band yeah. making, you know, making records, gradually figuring out how, how they were made. You know, we sort of, sort of yeah. met in the middle. And I, and I think that's probably why we're such a good team yeah because you're coming because yeah because places. we've got slightly different you know he he hears things that i that i i don't hear and he's also got the patience to work on things yeah. that i is he, haven't is he got quite the into the tech yeah totally yeah, yeah totally yeah. although even he will get you know he he will use an en another engineer generally so when we're when we're producing you know like for instance when we've just been working on a new pj harvey album we had another engineer rob Kerwin, that was recording everything okay and um sort of basically doing the tech stuff but sometimes flood will jump in mm. and start doing <laughs> the kind of crazy things that he does because he does yeah just sort of yeah. like sound design weird yeah stuff. like really weird sound design and, and he's also really good with um big old analog modular synths okay so there's quite a bit of that going on too yeah. which is so has he done ev every album pretty much since the albini like the pre pre he's done every one that Everyone that I've worked on, yeah. um, so he didn't do, there was two in the middle, um, Stories from the City and Uh Huh Huh. Oh the yeah, neither, were like yeah. Head and Rob. Yeah, so, Rob and yeah. Mick Harvey did Stories and Head, yeah. well, Pol you know, officially Polly produced Uh Huh Huh, but Head recorded everything. And, um, but otherwise, everything, yeah, me and Flood have, have, have yeah, worked yeah. on worked on everything, collaborated on every, every all the others. Actually, there's one that was done in Yeovil, wasn't there? Like, was it, is this yeah, it's this desire. They, mm. they, didn't they move like a massive desk in and tape machine? Like, I don't we know. moved a desk in, I don't remember. I'm sorry, moved a tape machine in. I don't think we did move a okay, desk I'll in. Okay, did you just have some like racks? Yeah, just bought a bunch of racks in. Yeah. It's pretty good. It's quite a dirty, trashy album. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I remember you saying that you did like some of dance or Laos Point on a like cassette four track. Which is, yeah, 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 I did. Um, um, most of the music was done on a four track cassette. Actually, yeah. it was. Um, was that like a creative or choice or? It, it, well, it was. Yes and no. I mean, it was like Polly had asked. Polly had seen me do some. I'd written the music for a touring production of Hamlet that we were doing at Yeovil College yeah, okay. when I was teaching there, and uh, Polly had come to see it. She really loved the music and um, asked me to write some music in a similar vein mm. that she could put words to. Um, so she lent me her little Yamaha four track cassette machine. Okay. And um, I had one, I had a 57, no outboard gear at all. So I plugged it, the 57 straight into the, uh, into the cassette machine. Okay. And recorded pretty much everything through that mic. Um, and most of the music on that album was done like that. Yeah. We then took those, <clears throat> I, I, so I then made a whole series of instrumental recordings which I gave to Polly and during the course of the To Bring You My Love tour she wrote lyrics often in different cities which well, is that, why is it, yeah, there's, the, there, there's, a, there's a, you know, a different city mm. in brackets at the end of all the titles. Um, so we came back and we recorded it in Small World with Head Engineering okay. and... So you um, just like print we just printed the the, the the four track, the the four tracks. Yeah. However, I bounced them onto four tracks of the sixteen tracks. Was that and on then, the MS sixteen? The task I guess it was. Yeah. yeah. And um, and Polly put the vocals on. Okay. And sometimes sometimes we did some other overdubs. Some I did a couple more new drums. Yeah, because it sounds and, like there's like there's quite a lot going on. But there, there is, but there was a lot going on on the original. Yeah. So were you bouncing like, on on down onto tracks? Yeah. Sometimes mm -hmm. I would do it. I would bounce four tracks onto a stereo DAT and oh, okay. then put the DAT back onto two tracks. Okay. Sometimes I would do it. I don't know why yeah. I did it like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there were all kinds of different, or well, sometimes I would do three tracks onto one. You know, there was no, yeah, you yeah. know, again, no, no kind of great plan. It was whatever was working. And also I did, sometimes I did, I did the drums for a couple of tracks at Giant Studios in Street because I really liked the drum sound I could get in there. Yeah. And then bounce that onto a stereo pair yeah, the drums sound cool. Like, I always thought you'd done those in the big room at, or the tall room at Small World. But... Okay, some of them were, okay. but some of them weren't. So, so a track like Taut, which has got probably the best drum yeah, sound yeah. on it, that was done at Giant. Wow. Um, and then bounced onto a cassette. But, but, but the drums on, say, uh, 
um, <coughs> uh, Healer and another track, um, Burn With Dead Flowers in a Drained Pool. The kind of rocky drums, more straightforward, they were, they were done at Small World. Okay. Yeah, because that, the room out the back, it was like quite high ceiling, wasn't it? And then yeah. it was like a weird like plaster, kind of, they'd sort of put moulds into it. I don't know yeah, if it was, okay, yeah. maybe it was different phases, but it's definitely how it ended up. I could, you know, yeah. it's a long time ago now, yeah. I don't remember. Mm. Um, but I'm really happy with, you know, that record has kind of stood the test of time remarkably yeah. well, I think. Yeah, it shows you what, like... Uh, Four track can sound pretty. Because cassettes are great. Four track cassettes yeah. are, re are really, really good. I think you know if you if you're really careful about what you what you're putting onto them. And yeah. but it's also to me seems remarkable. It was all done with one fifty seven and 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 no outboard gear whatsoever. You know. Yeah. And then did you just sort of mix it at Small World with head and yeah, that was it. Yeah. Mm. Cool. So yeah, I was having, having a look at your wiki earlier, and it seems sort of two thousand and one. You had sort of did. That Soul Jacker, you had Sparkle Horse, like Giant Sands, and Tracy Chapman sort of seemed like quite a busy, busy time. I, I guess it was, yeah, sort of early, yeah, early two thousands. Yeah. Um, so was that like another sort of point where it seemed like it was taking off a little bit, or uh, that was an interesting time because that was that was in the period when I wasn't working with Polly. So it's yeah. after I'd finished touring with PJ Harvey, and and it's when my kids were born. Okay. Um, so I was trying to be at home as much as I could. So obviously it didn't work out completely because I did mm. a Neil's tour and then I spent three months in San Francisco making a record with Tracy Chapman. But yeah. but they were things that, you know, obviously were really great experiences and things I wasn't I wanted wanted to do. So mm. it kind of made it work. And was that a similar time to when you did your solo album? Yes, it yeah. was. Yeah, but it, yeah, I was working on that as well um, at, the, at the same at the same time. Um, and the Sparkle Horse thing, obviously, you know, I was an enormous fan of Sparkle Horse, so yeah, yeah it's great. I've forgotten how much, because I listened to that today actually, and I've forgotten how well I know, know that album. I think we used to listen to it loads. It's, it's, as, it's, as a band. it's, a, it's a great record. Yeah. I mean, I only did three of the songs okay. on there. Um, but, um, but, but, you know, I worked on bits and pieces of the other ones, but of, of the finished ones, yeah. I'm, I, I was involved with three. But, um, yeah, it took me right, right back. Yeah. And then, and then, then, then another track that we did ended up on a, the, the next album as well, I think. But, um, but yeah, br brilliant band, and I thought mm. Mark was an amazing, amazing writer, and um, and uh, you know, it's, it's such a you know he passed away. Didn't yeah, yeah. T uh, absolute tragedy that, mm. that we that we lost him, and um, yeah, fantastic writer, really, really great. Uh, but that was, you know, that was an interesting period. So I got to work in some really cool studio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Certainly working on Tracy's record, we worked in the record plant in um, just north of San Francisco, which was, you know, just a brilliant studio. Yeah. Fantastic old Neve console, which nice. sounded amazing. And uh, and uh, you know, that was a luxury to be able to work with, you know, really amazing musicians with that yeah. sort of level of gear you know like they had three u47s that we could choose from to see oh, which right, was which the one nicest sounded... one you know amazing and uh, you know I mean, to, be, to be perfectly honest tracy chapman could sing through an sm57 mm. it would sound fantastic you know so it would whatever you whatever you'd have stuck up it would have sounded brilliant but, but we did pick one that was the one that was oh, you, so you, you did do the shoot yeah. we did yeah yeah because yeah. yeah. uh, tracy's very um She's really like you know if there's a, you know if there's a choice of things she will want to try them out and, and okay. find what's the best one that's yeah. the way she she approaches stuff and, and so it, t it totally worked for her and it was yeah it was really really good experience. Yeah. Were, you, were you playing on that one as well or were you just? I, I you know? a couple. I played bass on a couple of tracks I think and maybe some percussion and yeah. um, but I wasn't really I wasn't hired as a music I was definitely hired as a producer for that. Yeah, and then was that like taken off and mixed? Probably no, I mixed it oh, as mixed well. Mixed one? it with um, with the engineer. Okay, sort of on, on the session. On yeah, the yeah, we did. In fact, we were supposed to. We'd hired because at the studio they had um, they had a special mix room with like an enormous ninety six channel oh, SSL, top of the range SSL yeah. thing, and we that's where we what we'd booked to mix. But when we took the tapes in um, and put the tracks up on the SSL, having heard it through the knee all the time, mm. like we were kind of horrified, I have to okay. say. That's and so we just immediately said, just take it back. let's take it back. And we mixed it on the Neve. It was just, yeah. there was so much missing. 
I felt for me with them. On yeah, the, yeah, uh, it just, saturate really different. Yeah, yeah, it was just it sounded like a different recording, and you just thought, oh no. I'm, you know, and obviously, if you want to, if you want to do tons of stuff and recall tons of stuff, I, I get why SSLs works. Yeah. But but you know, for basic quality of sound, yeah. the old Neve, you know, which is, was all sort of ten seventy threes or something. You know, yeah, one just, of those like things. Yeah, you know, it just sounded fantastic. It was so warm and rich mm. the sound that you know we just thought we we're going to spend two weeks trying to get it up to where we were <laughs> yeah you know just you know so let's just mix it on the knee and it was great and there's no, obviously no recall or anything like that but that's that's fine you we didn't need to recall them we did mix the tracks and when we were happy with them we printed it yeah, yeah. and that was it oh cool cool yeah so yeah talking about desks how are you getting on so this is relatively new isn't it this yeah the Kadak. I, i've got it um uh um last year last summer um i realized i needed something better to for me, you know, I was working on a Mackie, an old yeah. Mackie 24 track, which which I actually loved. It was really a really a cool desk, mm. and was totally working for me. But but I was just having to. I realised there were more and more things I was having to tweak or alter at home, or yeah. that it would, because because it was getting harder and harder to get into playpen where I generally like to mix. Yeah. Um, and so I just figured, oh, maybe I should get a, a decent desk. For home, and I'd, I'd been thinking about Cadax for a little while, just because mm. I, I read so many good things about them, and, um, yeah. and sort of relatively affordable. I for, think for the for, for the money, I think they're yeah. they're they're amazing because they're really yeah. really well made, um, and I think that they're, that they're, they're, they're cheap because people because see them as as kind of live theatre desks, which is what this you know this desk came from a theatre in New York where they were on Broadway. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, because that's kind of what the because there's so many different routing options. There's loads of walks yeah, and that's things. All, all this stuff is, yeah. yeah, so 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 they're they're, they're really I that's what they're designed for. But you know they are great great sounding desks. Yeah, yeah. Also no compromise. Kind of. No, not 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 at all. They're really really mm. really really cool sound. So I've been I've been very happy. It took me a little while to get my head around it because there's no kind of master section. And so that's, I think, also what puts a lot of people off. Yeah. Isn't it? Well, how does the sound come out? So you have to send it through these buses through here. So it comes up here, uh, and then you send it out there out the, out the back. Um, but it's it's just a slightly different way of getting your head around things, mm. really. Uh, and obviously you need a separate, you know, I've got one of the Mackie big knobs for the you know yeah, just for the control yeah. room level so there's a there's a there's a sort of a couple of like heath robinson things that you've got to set up in order to make it work but for the as i say for the for the amount of for the amount of money it costs to, to you know to get a desk that sounds this good you know you'd really probably otherwise have to spend you know two or three times as mm. much money which just seemed yeah. a, a bit um you know more than i could justify for you know having in my own basement and the eqs are kind of like they're not upside down but they they kind of no, they kind of, yeah, the, the, yeah. They, they feel right, but they're they're labelled. It looks kind of yeah, the, yeah. The, I mean, the, you know, because obviously I've got the two different sort of channels. So so these are the mono channels, and these are what are called dual mono channels. So you've got your you know you can set them either as an input or an output. You just switch mm. up at the top, and they've got different different EQs. You've got three band EQ on the monos and four band on the dual monos. Um, I, I actually like the three band. I think it's mm. just for me it works fine. I think four bands kind of over the top. Mm. But what I do like about these ones is they've got a low pass filter as well as a high pass filter, and sometimes that's yeah, yeah, that's it's kind of useful. Yeah, there's, there's only a low pass on the uh, on the mono channels, but but there's something about um, you know just aesthetically, I like the layout of the mono channels a little bit better. But yeah, these look kind of a little bit. It's a little bit fiddly, yeah, yeah. yeah. Whereas where that's really clear, so you can totally see what you're doing straight away, which is which, which is great. But you like really happy with the, the sound? And yeah, the, yeah. Sound, sounds great. I've mixed quite a few things on it now, and it's um, yeah, it sounds really warm, rich, quite powerful. Yeah, because you you you've actually got a tried and you got a proper tried. Yeah, tried TSM. I, yeah. I also own down at, which is a playpen, but I hardly ever get to use mm. it these when, days. When did you get that? So that was a toy box. <laughs> yeah, I've had that for like yeah. nearly twenty years now. Yeah, um, and you know, I've done tons and tons of stuff on it over the years, and it's uh, yeah, it's a really really cool desk. So that was so. When did that move into toy box then? 
we moved it into Toy Box in nine, in 2004. Okay. Um, and then it, I can't remember when Ali moved to his current premises, like 20, 2018, 2017, 2018, about then. Yeah, since it's not been there for ages. Yeah, 2018, I think. So, so yeah, since then it's been there, been at Playpen. Cool, so what, what records did you do down at Toy Box then, um, in that phase? Oh God! Well, I guess we, I mean, you yeah, must have, was yeah. that your main kind of? Yeah, I mean, I did pretty much everything I worked on between two thousand and four and two thousand and sixteen. Most of it was done. Yeah. Most of it was done there, unless, yeah. unless I was going abroad to record. It pretty much always did there. Okay, yeah, it's an interesting kind of studio, wasn't it? It's yeah, it was great. Like, you know, it's really good. Like a yeah, real a little rabbit warren. Yeah, there. yeah, totally. But so many different spaces. You know, you could set up lots of, mm. you know, really interesting sort of setups and. Um, and uh, you know, and have really good separation. I mean, you couldn't see between that. That was probably yeah. so. There, you know, there were there were compromises. So, so, so it wouldn't work for everything. But generally, I, I really loved working there. It was great. Mm. Yeah, and that did that end up getting the building got bought or something? And yeah, it's yeah, been, it been just turned into of, flats. The same as loads yeah. of you know city centre studios. It's really a terrible thing. That, it's a shame. But mm. the playpen's cool. You yeah, know. it yeah, is. It's, yeah, it's great. It's really, really Ali's cool. got a good. Yeah. Thing. So it was that Ali was kind of like your main engineer then? Yeah, of, um, yeah, so for, from, so for that, that period of like 10, 12 years, you know, we, we worked together on a huge amount of records. Yeah. Uh, you know, I loved working with that. I still, still do, but we, you know, obviously he's doing well as a producer now and he's not available to just uh, <laughs> operate Pro Tools for me now, you know, yeah. when, uh, and, uh, which is, you know, which, which is cause great to see him. It's, you know, he's, he's excellent and it's yeah, really, yeah, lovely, really, really good to see him doing so well. So on the bigger stuff, will you typically sort of go and mix it with Ali down at Playpen? Or yeah, yeah, so it's certainly like the Aldous Harding records, yeah, you know, because um, you know, yeah. I've tracked them, I tracked the first one at J&J &J and tracked the, the second, the, well, what, Designer, or? Designer yeah. and the new one, Warm Chris, we tracked at Rockfield. Okay. But um, in fact, Party, we couldn't mix that one, because that was, that was in the transition when... Um, yeah, it was about a year it, or so. Yeah, it was yeah. when um, Ali didn't have a studio, yeah. but he came into J and J and and engineered the mix for me there. And, oh, you mixed that one at yeah, we mixed it at J and J, okay. but Ali brought in quite a lot of outboard gear yeah. Yeah, for he's that. Got, he's got a fair bit. <laughs> yeah, more more than enough. Yeah. More, more than healthy. Uh, but um, yeah, he worked with me on the mix of the other two at, at Playpen. Yeah, is that the same one the dry cleaning? Stuff? He did the new one. Yeah. But not the first one. The first one I mixed at Invader with um, Stu, Stu Matthews. Okay, yeah, yeah. Mm. Oh, okay. Yeah, they got some nice stuff down Yeah, no, it's great. Yeah, do you yeah. use in Invader? I, yeah, I mean, obviously Invader's really convenient for me because it's about 200 yards down yeah. the road. But it's, um, it's Jeff is in there an awful lot to work on film stuff. Yeah, it's so almost it's, like a private. Yeah, it's quite difficult yeah. to get. I think I've got a session booked in the summer. So I'm going to do yeah, it's good layout. There. It's like an ex-BBC. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. I did a session there once when it was a BBC studio. So okay. when we were touring Dance Hall at Louse Point, we did yeah. a BBC session there. Okay. Yeah, it's a great studio. Because mm. I think it was just sat there for years, kind of empty. It was. I think it was owned by um, the guy at the Mission. What's his name? Um, Wayne Hussey. Okay. I think he had it for a long time, but just you know, just as a private studio, yeah. wasn't it? Ah, but so I it think it. Just... But I think it was there. I think it mm. was still there. Because yeah, the other one's that uh, Christchurch studio that's like an amazing kind of yeah, BBC up in that's the a great. But yeah, I haven't. I did a couple of things there, but not for. Yeah. It's been years since I've been. I think like it's more the than old twenty years. Theater. I think. I think maybe it is. It's still got. got is it the, still got the gear? Yeah, all in the there. gear and all the mic. I went and had a look round. Right. Okay. Yeah, it's amazing. Like live room. Yeah. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. Are there any sort of techniques you kind of come back to, sort of like mic techniques on drums and guitars or? Any the, typical things, or is it point the mic at it? And... Yeah, there's, there's no, I don't have a sort of set way of doing things, you know, yeah. because things, um, you know, the more records I've made, the more I've kind of learnt that, that things change once you get going on something, so, that, so mm. there's not a lot of point going in with a definite idea yeah, of how you want to my, do something. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously when I was starting off, I was much more, did a lot more pre-production because I didn't, I was a bit more nervous about how things were going to turn out, so I wanted to have a, an idea and a mm. and a plan. But um, but working with the first time I worked with Giant Sand, you know, that went out the window in like ten minutes. Yeah. So I realised, okay, <laughs> uh, and and then it ended up being the best record I felt, the best record I'd done up to that time. So yeah. it was, um, I thought, oh, you don't, you know, you just you just have to go, go with, with with the flow. Yeah, and and it's about and it reminded me really of you know that of working with Richard Mazda, you know, like you. 
it's about capturing the energy of yeah. something. So it's like, don't get caught up in, to you know, in, in too many, in too many sort of technical things. So like, don't spend eight, you know, it, like make sure the sounds are good straight straight away. So like, let let the band set up or the artist set up. If there's a good sound from stick stick a microphone in front of it, you know, whatever microphone's nearest there, mm. uh, uh, and get a sound up as quickly as you can. Before while while, while they're kind of excited because that's that's when you're gonna cap, yeah. capture something good. So, I mean, you know, I have favorite, you know, like some mics are better on some vocalists than others, but you know, a, a lot of the time, gear to me, to me, gear is gear. You know, there it's there's all kinds of levels of it. You know, I would love to record everything through a U47, through an old Neve mm. board with an LA2A <laughs> over it. You know, but that's that's often not not around, and actually that doesn't work for everything either. Some yeah. things. Some things that 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 that's not going to be the case. So it's it really is about about using using what you've got and just being. To, to me, it's about being aware of the situation as you know more, more than anything else. You know, figuring out what how, how to make people comfortable so they're going to be giving a really good yeah. performance. And sometimes that's sometimes people want you to spend a bit of time setting things up because it. It makes them feel a little bit more reassured. Where some other people are going to get really bored if it's not yeah. ready in two minutes, and so you, you figure out what what's working for different people, and you and you go with that, and you, you and you use the gear accordingly. And I've noticed that you know, good, experienced engineers pick up on that really quick. I don't even have to say that to some of the engineers I work with. They they're so used to it. They go, mm. Okay. <laughs> We've got to get this one going really, really fast, and and, and, and it's already there. And, and while the band is talking about what song they're about to do, they're already thinking, okay, that's going to involve that okay. guitar. That yeah, one. And so it's also so by the time they've gone into the room, they didn't even notice that the mics have been moved around, and now yeah. there's new setups there. It was just already, and they can go in and play, and that okay. and that's how it should be. Because you don't want you don't want them to be distracted by things like that. You want them to be like the, you know absolutely in the moment of the performance mm. yeah because your guitar has like you, you can always it's got a distinctive kind of sound so i did wonder if you had any like sort of like go-to things but i guess, it's, I guess it's, it's more just it's kind more of taste in the way i mix things and yeah. and, and and um and balance things i think okay. i mean I, I i don't have a go-to way of doing things but i definitely have a particular taste that, I, that i've noticed that I, I, I think I was quite resistant to that idea when I started producing, and I would say, oh, no, mm. I, you know, if, you know, I work with, with with the bands, and they sound, you know, like like the bands. But after a while, when there was a lot of records, I think, hmm, you know, what I can hear. Mm. <laughs> there are definitely ways that I, I will mix things and uh, uh, and sounds that, I, that I'm drawn to that work for me. That, that I, you know, because I want to be engaged by a recording. You know, I want to. I don't want to be aware that I'm listening to a recording. I want to be, it's like reading a good book or seeing a good film. You, you don't think about the acting or the lighting or, you know, the prose in a book or something like that. You're gripped by the whole thing. Later on, you can look back and think, oh yeah, that that's great because that, you know, that is a beautiful sentence or that is a beautiful shot of that film. But at the time, yeah. you're in it, aren't you? Yeah. And, and sometimes if you start noticing those other things, you lose a little bit, you get a bit distracted and then you're not quite, you don't, you're mm. not as engaged with the thing. And for me, a good recording is something that... You shouldn't notice the no, recording. you shouldn't. Mm. You should be totally drawn into what's going on, to the music. You know, okay, like if we're, you know, we're talking about recordings now, so if we were going to play something, we would be listening to it in that different way. But your average listener, most people, even, you know, when I'm listening to something on the radio, I'm not thinking, how was that recorded? Yeah, or, or, or I'm only thinking that if, I, if there's something I don't like that comes mm. up suddenly like there's a really weird reverb or something or think that doesn't sound like it's in the same space as that and it totally drags you out of the song doesn't it most of the time you just listen to what am I liking this song you know yeah yeah like a good a good review of an album's one when they don't mention anything yeah. about the recording at all cause, yeah you know because they're totally yeah yeah they're, it's nice to be like mm, not mentioned like yeah anything about but that's a good, that's a <laughs> yeah, good, yeah. good thing okay yeah should we have a, a bit more of a look around at some of your other, other stuff yeah of course um, you've got some cool bits right okay so this is yeah this is the kind of basic rack that, I'm, that i use at home and this is <clears throat> i kind of actually take this one with me to to studios when i'm mixing so i tend to use um the Thermionic Culture Swift and the Alan Smart as my kind of mix bus compression okay, and EQ. Yeah, yeah, wherever I'm going, yeah, I, tend, yeah. I tend to take that. 
okay. uh, with me because I just think it's um, they just both work. For yeah. Me, or as you know, the 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 Alan Smart's great because I don't like to. I tend not to smash mixes a, a, anyway, and it's just some, it's just really good for just holding things. And it's, that's kind of like a sort of souped up SSL. Yeah, it, it's compressor. it's really yeah, it's yeah. like an SSL bus compressor exactly. Exactly. Yeah, very very similar. And um, okay, is this this adds a bit of. Yeah, that just, well just, just generally, I mean, you can, you can see what I've got it set on, and it's, yeah. it's pretty much always set on. I, I don't tend to use a lot of mids. Sometimes if something's really, if something's really muddy, I might use some of the mid cut. Yeah. Okay. I nearly always add some bass, and it, and it just adds it in a really, really warm way, not muddy. Mm. It just get, gives you a bit of extra low end. Um, the air is great. Which is just obviously, as you would expect, it's like very, very high. Yeah. It's almost in inaudible, but it just opens up the track. And, um, is that, um, and that's a shelf boost. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a cut. That's a cut. Oh, so it's, yeah, oh, it's, so it's that's just, so, so I'm just, yeah. I'm just ta yeah, I'm taking everything. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's. I mean, you know, there's nothing really much going on yeah, yeah. down there, but uh, but some, some, sometimes you, sometimes you need that. Uh, the thing that I did tend to actually change is the presence. Sometimes I just need to kick. The presence up a little bit more on some mixes okay. if I feel it's a yeah. a little bit dull, but it's it's just a really really warm um, organic mm. sounding thing, and you can actually you can you can actually really wind the treble up or the bass up, and it doesn't it doesn't, get doesn't go crazy. Yeah. It's really it can be really really nice. Mm. I mean, I, I really like most of the stuff that they make. I think they're yeah, very they're cool. Yeah, they're cool. And um, it's just a bunch of. Their stuff down at down at Ali's. Is, he's got yeah, he's got quite a few things, yeah. and they've, they've got loads at small at um, Invader as well, and also at Loud Mastering where I oh yeah sort of yeah yeah of course yeah. yeah he sent me a video of doing yeah, the Chesterfield system right it's pretty much all the yeah, culture stuff yeah right? oh nice and then this is and then this, this is, yeah this, this is, is, this is new, track it? yeah this is uh, yeah it's new to me I mean it's a yes yeah, I've bought it's, it's like twenty five years old or something now but it's um. It's really great for, uh, oh, it's pretty much great for everything, but I, 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 I thought I needed something good for vocals. It was very yeah. smooth, and, um, uh, but, but that you could, you know, you could squash things a little bit if you, if you needed to, and it's, it's really great, it's really great for that. Yeah, I guess because you've got the two kind of... Yeah, I've, yeah, I've got like, different versions of, of I, have, yeah. I haven't got a, a proper 1176, but I've got the, uh, yeah, the Black Lion, yeah, these are going to be really good. Yeah, it's quite aggressive. It, it, can, it can be, and it's, but what's nice about it is it's got a dry, wet kind of mix on it, so you can really, it's quite, it's very, it's a very usable compressor, yeah. re, what, what, the way you can kind of dial in exactly exactly what you need. Um, th this one I tend to use a lot more, more on the way in, really, so I, I use it yeah, in it's conjunction great, with the 610, yeah. and it's just really nice. Yeah, you've had that for ages. Yeah, very first yeah, I've had it had it for years. It's just one of those things that kind of always, all, all, always works. Uh, the other thing that always works is the DBX. I think they're, yeah, yeah. I think they're they're really great. I'd like I'd like to get another one because it's a bit odd just having the one, but it's quite hard finding, finding the American made ones. Okay, oh, that, yeah. Because um, I mean, I've had you know again, I've had this for I don't know twenty twenty more than twenty yeah. years. You probably get one, and then they wouldn't. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it'd be a bit, a bit pointless. And I also like the SPX ninety, yeah, yeah. which is you know again is. Um, I've got one. Yeah, there's definitely some music. Yeah, there. like a really ancient piece of gear, but there's something there's something great about it. You know, like a. And they're recognisable kind of sounds because they obviously get used so much. On, uh, yeah, on but they're they're kind of cool. I like I like. I mean, I I don't very often use digital reverbs or. I'm, or, or even plug-in reverbs, really. I mean, I tend to use the, here I've got an old spring in yeah. the corner, yeah. and, um, and as we were saying earlier on, like if I'm recording vocals at, at um, Rockfield, I'm gonna always track the chamber, the, uh, the chamber if, yeah. I, if I wanna use reverb, but there's something kind of a bit crunchy about yeah, this. Yeah, is it the like, room? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, the plate one is pretty, is pretty oh, good. It doesn't sound like a plate. Yeah, yeah but it's but it's got a it's, it's kind of got the sound sort of cranky sound, which, yeah. which I, I really like. You can sort of rehear really it if you want a reverb that you're going to really hear. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. like sometimes if I want something that's an effect rather than a, a natural mm. kind of reverb sound, then I, then I might I might pull that one out. 
So yeah. So is this yeah. So this guitar is is the um, it's my it's the first guitar I ever bought. I've had it since yeah. 1982. Where did you get that um, from? Then? It was a little village near Yetminster, though, whose name escapes okay. me right now. Right, but, right in Trinity, uh, no, w I would have remembered yeah. that. And it, was, um, it was, you know, in the Western, the Western Gazette was advertised, and it was, um, I remember, it was £220. Nice. And most of the time, the telecaster of those days was about £200. So okay. it was a bit more expensive than normal, but I thought it was particularly nice. Yeah, yeah. So, so I bought it. It's a 68 telly. Oh, nice. It's probably, probably worth, worth a little like bit 20 more. times what I paid for it now, yeah, but, yeah. Um, which is crazy, but it's, um, yeah, it, it's just a, a brilliant guitar. Yeah, it's a bit different. Though. Yeah, the, these, the, this was on there when I bought it. It was, it's yeah. called an Andy Summers bridge, apparently, okay. because, I guess, because Andy Summers was using it at that, at that time. So it's not the original bridge part, which was probably, it's probably knocked off a thousand pounds off the yeah. <laughs> but, but you know, I'm never going to sell it, so it doesn't really matter to me, but it's just, it's a, you know, I don't buy guitars for investments, I buy them because I yeah. like, like to play them. Yeah. But so, it's been, it's been damaged, you can see it's, the paintwork was damaged there, where um, a strap melted into it when it was, this one along with two other guitars was left in a guitar trunk on in the airport in LAX outside oh, right. in the sun oh, right. and it heated up so much melted the, strap. the lacquer melted on this okay. guitar you can see it on the back there I don't know if you can see it in the camera oh, yeah, right. the awesome. light. can you see yeah, it? yeah yeah oh, all right. okay. did it was the neck and everything okay the neck was okay yeah, yeah. but the but it obviously yeah, 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 it just it melted and then solidified that's the that's the flight case the foam of the flight case oh, melted onto it melted okay. into it yeah but my, my other main guitar is um, that I play live is um, is this Jazzmaster from 65. Yeah, where did, where did you get that from? I bought that in Tucson in a, in a guitar store in Tucson called Rainbow Guitars okay. um, in the mid 90s. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and it was just, it was kind of on a, on a whim really. I just, I, re I, I just thought I really was like a Jazzmaster mm -hmm. and I was just chatting to I was on holiday, I wasn't there to buy a guitar or anything, but my friend Howe sort of took me to this store yeah. which, and they had two 65 Jazz Masters. The other one technically was probably a better guitar, but there was just something about this one, I just loved the look of this guitar and yeah. and um, and so yeah, so I bought it. It feels, like, I think it feels a bit chunkier than a yeah, sort of... It is quite, it is quite yeah. chunky because I've played um, another one from the same year recently and I noticed the neck was really felt really thin yeah, to me. Yeah. But I, I think, you know, I learned on a, I learned to play guitar on a sort of a, a Spanish guitar. So I, I, was, used I sort to. of learned with really quite a chunky neck. And so I've always yeah. found electrics to be, they always felt like, oh, they're, they're like a bit, a bit insubstantial. Yeah. yeah. I, I would sort of almost kind of get the strings confused. So, so I quite like a sort of a chunky yeah. neck. Probably. With that one, I mean, you know, they're as chunky. And then <laughs> this, this is the op this is the opposite. This is so chunky; it's almost unplayable. But it's something great. It's a Polish twelve-string yeah. electric, which is I don't know how the tune is going to be. Not bad. Pickups are cool. Oh yeah, yeah. it's yeah. like so soapy pickups. Yeah, yeah. They're they're really great. I'm just. You know, it's a really tacky guitar, but there's something that's, I, I, I really love the sound of it. And so I've been using this quite a bit recently on, yeah, on, yeah. on some new recordings. And then this one I've been using, I've used oh, yeah, a lot, the yeah, little yeah. Um, parlor guitar, which is from around 1870, I think, because it's a really ancient yeah. thing. It's cool with the frets that go on. Yeah, I know, that's so interesting, isn't it? Um, that kind of a guitar for the, for the ladies to sort of it, yeah it was exactly that's exactly what it was yeah ladies of leisure would yeah. play it in the in the parlor <laughs> hence, hence hence the name and um but yes yeah, so, i mean it's made by a luthier called laurent um there's a sort of a stamp inside that you can see but it's but it's great and i've used this i mean hannah plays this on all the Aldous harding records okay so it's probably the main guitar that we've really? used on the last yeah well, while I've been working with her, okay. and I've also used it quite a bit on um, on Polly's new record, so it's, yeah. um, it, it gets a lot of studio work. I mean, the trouble is, is actually trying to find something that 
that's the equivalent for live work yeah, because it's got such a good sound this one yeah. that it's, it's quite hard to then to then get something that's working like that, 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 that that's something that I'm thinking about for the next PJ Harvey tour and like how to um, it, yeah, yeah. how to replicate this sound because I this one I don't think it actually belongs to my wife so I can't take it out to her even it's like an antique isn't it yeah it's, it's it, I don't think it would it would respond well to that and no, then, no, also no. you need I need to put some kind of a pickup on it. Yeah, it's trying to compete with drums. Yes, yeah, so it's some. But yeah, beautiful guitar. What that? What sound does Harding do live then? Just, just like a. She's got an old Spanish guitar that we found in a in the Electric Ladyland in Bristol. The oh, okay, right, the, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the yeah the store that's always an adventure. Mm. That's just got a pickup on it. it. It's great. It's a really yeah. nice guitar. I can't even remember what the. No, it's no, nothing. Sort of no famous name, but mm -hmm. it just has a really good. Yes, I think it's probably from the sixties, and it's yeah. just quite it just warm and yeah, it sounds really cool. Cool. Well, this has been fun. Yeah, thanks for having me down. Ah, and, uh, really good yeah, to see you, Ben. Yeah, it's been really interesting. Cool. Thank you.